Hello there, my fellow notebook aficionados. I'm sure your timeline is absolutely swamped with reviews and videos about this guy right here in front of me. This is the VivoBook S15 and it seems like ASUS generously shipped them all around the world to give you a first real world look at what Qualcomm's new Snapdragon Silicon can do for Windows on ARM. It has been about 9 months since these chips were officially announced and since then we have been promised nothing short of the next big revolution in our PC experience. And well, I do not want to spoil this review too much, but our experience with this one was almost flawless. If you were to peel the sticker from the chassis, you would have absolutely no way of knowing that there is not an x86 CPU by either Intel or AMD powering the VivoBook. But at the same time, the overall user experience is also pretty much the same. Do not get me wrong, this is the first notebook we have in the studio powered by the Snapdragon X Elite. And we will see how things develop over the next few months when both hardware and software catch up. But as far as first impressions go, is it really enough for Windows on ARM to be the same Windows PC experience we already know? Well, let's get into it. Alright, let's start at the beginning. The VivoBook S15 is powered by the smallest available variant of Snapdragon X Elite CPUs, the X1E78100. It rolls right off the tongue, doesn't it? In the 15 inch aluminum chassis we assume it is allowed around 45 watts for short bursty loads and 30 watts sustained. And the 12 core chip comes with an integrated Adreno GPU we know pretty much nothing else about. In addition we get 16 gigs of crazy fast soldered memory, a 1TB SSD and a high res OLED that refreshes at 120Hz, making the VivoBook a pretty solid all day notebook. I know we are all here for the meaty CPU and GPU performance results, but let me still walk you through what is on offer with this one. Again, the all metal chassis feels and looks great, even though getting back to a 16 by 9 aspect ratio does feel a little different at first. Rigidity both for the base unit and the display lid offers very little reason to complain, even though the hinges could be a tad bit stiffer. But overall, the lightweight VivoBook offers more than adequate build quality for its price point. Port selection is great as well, with an HDMI 2.1, a pair of USB-C 4s, a micro SD card reader with embarrassingly slow transfer rates and the audio combo port on the left and a pair of USB-A 3.2 Gen 1s on the right. In regards to wireless transfers, you are covered as well with Qualcomm's Wi-Fi 7 chip that offers very snappy and reliable transfers and the 1080p webcam delivers a pretty good picture even though it's not a huge departure from what we have seen before. Below the aluminium base cover, you have access to the single NVMe slot for future storage upgrades, but that's it. As per usual, ASUS did their homework when it comes to both the keyboard and the touchpad and typing the script for this video on the VivoBook was a very pleasant experience. The switches offer quite a bit of travel, solid tactility and a comfortable feel and most of you should get up to speed here rather quickly. If you like the layout however will depend on your personal preference, especially the slimmed down keys for the numblock do take quite some time to get used to. The touchpad works very well for everything you do on a daily basis and ASUS started to roll out additional functionality with this one that lets you adjust volume, display brightness and even skip through videos by sliding along the edges. Before we finally get to performance, let's quickly have a look at the display. Subjectively, the 120Hz OLED with its pretty quirky resolution of 2880 by 1620 is a great fit for everyday tasks, media consumption or even content creation. Brightness is rather low though at not even 400 nits and as is typical for OLEDs, you will have to deal with PWM at 240Hz. While doing our display measurements, we also encountered the first real problem with the Snapdragon platform. The software we are using to calibrate the displays of our review samples simply refused to work. It's not a huge deal for the VivoBook since Delta E's are almost on reference level out of the box and as is typical for ASUS they even include some additional presets, but this sort of experience might be something you will have to deal with when using this sort of niche third party software. Alright folks, let's finally discuss the performance experience for Windows on ARM starting today. I did not want to do a separate video just for the CPU deep dive, since not only will we have a detailed article about all of that on the website, but especially when it comes to laptops. The user experience is so much more than just benchmark results and as I have mentioned already, in the beginning you are not losing out on anything when going with a Snapdragon powered notebook. But at the same time you're also not getting anything that is vastly superior to what an Intel or AMD powered laptop can do. 
there is still a fan inside this one. And while this objective performance experience is incredibly snappy and you do not really have to deal with finding out if software runs natively or is emulated, on paper the X Elite is not that much faster than recent silicon from Team Red or Blue. At its core, the X Elite X1E78100 is a 12 core CPU. And since it's the lowest and variant of four available chips, it does not support hyperthreading or any form of boost functionality. And clock speeds max out at 3.4 GHz, while the faster versions of this chip can reach up to 4.3 GHz. So it will be very interesting to see what those will bring to the table once we get our hands on final samples. For now, there's also no way to accurately read the isolated power draw of the silicon. But judging from our general measurements, we assume around 45 to 50 watts during peak load scenarios and around 30 to 35 watts under sustained load. For our benchmarks, we try to stay as close as possible to our usual set of tests to properly put the new silicon into perspective, with what is currently available. So you just have to remember that some benchmarks are emulated, which might severely impact our measured performance figures. This becomes immediately noticeable when comparing Cinebench R23 to R24. While the older version does not paint a very favorable picture for the new chip both when it comes to single and multi-core loads, the natively running R24 shows that the Snapdragon can indeed compete without a problem. Just keep in mind that when it comes to laptops, the performance you are getting is heavily influenced by the power levels set by the manufacturers, so your results will vary greatly between different notebooks. But even the slowest variant of the X Elite can keep up with Intel's Meteor Lake Core Ultra 7 in the multi-core test, which is quite impressive, especially on launch day, and in single-core scenarios it only has to yield to Apple's M3 generation of ARM chips. Geekbench paints a similar picture and shows impressive performance results without revolutionizing what we have seen so far from a mobile CPU. Again, if you want to dive deeper into our results and for more benchmark numbers from a whole host of tests, please head on over to our written review. And for the nitty gritty details when it comes to power consumption and efficiency, check out our analysis article as well. Our subjective performance impression is impressive, even though our numbers from Crossmark do paint a very different picture, hinting once again on Microsoft's emulation layer having to do some heavy lifting behind the scenes. Our browser benchmarks on the other hand can dominate both Intel and AMD, and once again the X Elite only has to play second fiddle to Apple's M3. Alright, that should cover the CPU part of the new silicon, so how about the GPU? Generally speaking, especially when it comes to games, you will most likely come across the most problems with what will run on your new machine and what doesn't, and we really would have wished either Qualcomm or Microsoft would give users some form of indication what runs natively and what needs emulation. In our synthetic tests though, the smaller Snapdragon is not quite able to keep up with the competition, with no real difference between emulated tests like 3 dmarks Time Spy or Firestrike, or natively running benchmarks like 3 dmarks Wildlife Unlimited or Geekbench. But as we have seen with Intel's Arc iGPUs, it may take some time for Qualcomm to level the playing field with driver support, and only time will tell if they are able to improve in this regard. So if you are into video games, the VivoBook and to that extent maybe even most of the Snapdragon powered notebooks should maybe not be your preferred choice, even though most of the games we tested do run and you are still able to experience some very basic casual gaming with these laptops. So how about fan noise? Well, Qualcomm liked to mention efficiency in everything and compared their new chips to Apple's M3, especially in something like the MacBook Air 15, a passively cooled machine. Well, fast forward to today, we get a chip that consumes up to 50 watts, and there is simply no way you can deal with that much heat without an active cooling solution. While we did say the performance experience is pretty much the same as with Intel or AMD based laptops when it comes to power draw and the resulting fan noise, at least for the VivoBook, you also get the same experience. Even though I would say that this is not really something to be proud of since, well, the idea was to get more efficient silicon for a quieter computing experience, it seems like it's not just about abandoning x86 for an ARM based architecture after all. To give you a more subjective impression, for the VivoBook we recorded some noise samples and I also included some samples for the speakers which are alright but lack the bass and fuller sound of something like the RG G14 or Lenovo Yoga Pro 9i.
Our temperature tests reveal a less than ideal picture as well, with more than 50 degrees in the bottom center of the chassis during full CPU and GPU load, which is quite toasty to be honest. While this might of course be a limitation of the VivoBook's cooling solution, it seems like these chips do run quite hot as well. So it will be very interesting to see how this situation will develop with the faster variants of Qualcomm Silicon. So what does all of this mean for battery life? Well, with about 13 hours in our standard Wi-Fi test, the VivoBook performs adequately. And we actually would not complain about it too much, but once again, it feels like the results we are getting are falling somewhat short of what was promised. Since these results are more or less in line with what we can already get today. And the experience is once more about the same as you would get with an Intel or AMD based machine. That said, it's just way too early to make general assumptions. And we will have to wait and see until we have been able to test more notebooks powered by the new CPUs. So please make sure to subscribe so you will not miss our upcoming coverage. We have a lot more notebooks incoming. And we are already working on reviews for the new Microsoft Surface Pro and Samsung's Galaxy Book Edge for example. Alright folks, so let's wrap it up for now. In general, the VivoBook is a great everyday notebook. You get a solid, all aluminium chassis, a generous selection of ports, a simply stunning display and comfortable inputs. And all of this is paired with a snappy performance experience that does not involve a lot of compromises, even though we are dealing with a completely new underlying architecture. In addition, you get access to all of Microsoft's Copilot Plus features, which will remain exclusive to the platform for now. And we will have a separate video coming for all of that quite soon. But still, we kind of expected more, which mostly comes down to Qualcomm's marketing and what they have promised in the past few months. Yes, they are able to compete, which is quite a win for a technically first-gen product and considering how their CPUs delivered in the past. But then again, they kind of promised some sort of revolution when it comes to mobile computing, which we simply did not see for now. In addition, especially when it comes to the VivoBook, variants with Intel or AMD are quite a bit cheaper, which of course raises the question of overall value as well. I will also do some further testing when it comes to content creation applications, since my initial testing with Photoshop and Lightroom for example left me quite impressed, while Resolve 19, which did just get a native ARM version, left me wanting quite a bit. So once again, please make sure to subscribe so you will not miss our upcoming coverage for all of these new notebooks. That should also be it for today. Please sound off in the comments below what you think about the VivoBook and Windows on ARM in general, now that we have finally been able to experience it for real. Do you like what you see? Did you expect more? I can't wait to read what you have to say. Thanks a ton for watching guys. Leave your like if you felt entertained. My name is Alex, you have been fantastic and I cannot wait to see you all in the next one. Take care.